So I'm just going to get this going here. So let me actually formally introduce our speaker tonight since I think we can probably give you better justice than this year intro. Um, so T Dr. Patrick McGann is our speaker tonight. He received his PhD in microbiology uh, from the National University of Ireland in 2004 with a focus on the interface between animal and human environments um, and contributed to the spread of antibiotic resistance. Um, in 2010, Dr. McGann joined the nascent uh, multi-drug resistant organism repository and surveillance network uh, at the Walter Reed Army Institute, where he's currently the chief of molecular research, and he's been the author of several publications, and I'm, we're all very excited to hear what you have to say tonight. So, I'll be further ado. Thank you very much, Will, for that introduction. I'll stick my water down there. Um, so, as Will just mentioned, my name is Patrick McGann. Um, uh, six years ago, I joined this mouthful of an organization called the Multidrug Resistant Organism Repository and Surveillance Network, the MRSN, which was really nascent at the time and it was set up by the Army in response really to what was an outbreak of multidrug resistant Acinetobacter baumannii that swept through the hospitals here in the United States, the military hospitals uh, during the Iraq War. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, but during that time, I, just prior to that, I was working as a for um, for uh, a, well, we had a BSL three lab, and I was working on Francisella tularemia, tularemia vaccines prior to that. But they moved everything up to Frederick. I didn't want to go to Frederick, so I jumped ship and went to the MRSN, and that's where I've been. So um, very very uh, excited to speak to you tonight. Thank you very much for the One Health organization for asking me to talk. Um, I've been actually coming here for probably three or four years on and off. Sometimes Thursday nights can be difficult to make. Um, but tonight I really want to talk about a topic that's very close to my heart, which is um, how antibiotic resistance genes move among bacteria. So we're all aware of the rising threat of antibiotic resistance. But when you really get down into the nuts and bolts, it's actually a really fascinating and intricate story of how an organism or a group of organisms have adapted to a very dra dramatic change in not just their lifestyle, but also in their environments. Um, I have, of course, because I work and I'm now a government civilian, as I got my citizenship last year. So now I'm a, a government civilian, I have to give my you know, conflicts of interest. So these are my own views and are not to be construed as representing the Department of Defense, Department of Army, or Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. Um, so tonight, as I mentioned, I want to talk about how antibiotic resistance genes move, but you know, I think it's also a good time to go back over the whole history. So I'm going to give you a little bit of brief introduction to the history of antibiotics. So we we'll go back to um, back to the early turn of the 19th century and take a little brief tour up to the late 1940s when we really saw penicillin emerge as the first mass marketed drug. And then I'll take a little swing into antibiotic resistant mechanisms. I'm going to try and keep everybody entertained. So. Hopefully uh, nobody's going to fall asleep or we get too confused. And just some cliff notes on antibiotic resistance in general. And then finally I'm going to get down to the part that's probably going to be the most challenging in terms of keeping everybody entertained. But we're going to talk about the vehicles of resistance and how these antibiotic resistance genes move um, throughout the bacterial populations. And I might have some conclusions if we have some time at the end, and maybe a little bit of discussion about where we see the future of antibiotic resistance going. So without much ado, let's go back to Paul Ehrlich uh, in 1904. And really, you can trace the history of antibiotics back to Paul Ehrlich. So back at this stage, at the early turn of the 19th century, there was, um, or 20th century, should I say, um, there was a significant um, threat in terms of syphilis. So it was a really um, widespread disease that affected many, many people. And there was a, a large screening pro program started up by this man, Paul Ehrlich, to find a treatment for what was the, the causative agent of syphilis at that time, trypanoma pallidomia. And this large screening was actually became really the, the bedrock of all, plan, all future efforts by the pharmaceutical, the eventual pharmaceutical industry to develop drugs, which is large-scale screening where you took multiple compounds and you tried them, you just tested them consistently against the organism to see which one would work. And this led to development of the very first antibiotic, Salvarsin, um, which had to be given inje as an injection, and there was, it had some serious side effects, and it, shortly thereafter there was a less toxic derivative called Neosalvarsin. 
salvarsin. So this was really the first effective antibiotic that saw broad scale application across the community. And this, because of this approach that Paul developed, um, this was taken up by some other researchers and it led to probably one of the most, and I say this in, in a kind of a, um, a very broad sense, the sulfur drugs, when they came out, and, and you can even see the effects of the sulfur drugs in antibacterial, antibiotic resistance today, which I'll talk a little bit more about later on, but it's really a striking example of one of the first drugs that came out that was widespreadly used. This, it was known as prontosil at the time, um, but you can see the effects of that widespread use of, of this drug uh, even 100 years later in the genomes of the bacteria, and we, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. But of course, this was all just a lead up to what was really the fundamental story that we all hear in high school about the development of antibiotics. And this is Alexander Fleming and penicillin. You see a picture of him here at his laboratory doing what he did. It was actually a pretty interesting story. It's one of those anecdotal um, tales that you hear in science um, that kind of makes you appreciate how fluid and how different directions science can take you. So he had actually gone on vacation. He arrived back on September the 3rd, 1928. It's a Monday. Who gets anything done on a Monday? But he did. So he arrived in and he was sorting through some of his petri dishes where he had some staphylococcus growing on his plates. And sure enough, he found, interestingly enough, one of... So his plates were overgrown. He had just come back from vacation. Uh, staphylococcus growing everywhere on his plates. But on one plate, he noticed around this particular mold, there was um, a, grow, a zone of inhibition, so no bacteria growing around this mold. Uh, it was interesting enough, it's actually a very pretty rare mold, so penicillin notatatum uh, is not one of the more common penicillins. So the actual fact that it fell on his plate, I mean, eventually it probably would have been discovered, but it just goes to show you how much look plays a role in these early discoveries, because this particular species of penicillin is not a very common mold. But over the next couple of years, um, you know, they were able to find out that it was secreting some sort of compound that they called the mold juice, which was able to kill a wide variety of bacteria. So not just Staphylococcus, but had a wide variety of um, activity against other, bacteria, uh, other different species of bacteria. And interesting enough, when they actually published these results in 1928, um, because they had such a difficult time uh, isolating large quantities of this, what would become penicillin, um, there was only a passing mention in his paper about the therapeutic applications because it was very unstable, it broke, very da broke down very quickly, and they were not able to, um, uh, to get it in sufficient quantities. But of course, as is always the case in science, along comes another team, and this was Howard Florey and Ernest Chain in Oxford University. And they, I guess, probably had seen Alexander Fleming's paper and realized the potential of what they could do with penicillin and went about for the next 10 years trying to find ways of purifying and stabilizing the compound. And of course, as we all know, this led to the uh, industrial production of penicillin uh, in a sufficient quantities and of suffi sufficient purity that was able to be used for clinical testing. And, of course, the mass production of penicillin was just introduced in time for the end of World War II. And it's reflected here by a poster that you can see from the United States Army in 1945, um, where penicillin had a dramatic impact, even at just with a couple of, even though there was only a few months left in the war, but the, the impact that it had on medicine uh, and the treatment of soldiers at that time was pretty profound. Very interesting tale. And of course, once penicillin came out and people realized how important it was um, and the strategy that was used by initially by, by Alexander Fleming and by Paul Ehrlich, you saw over the next couple of decades from the 1950s to the 1970s this explosion in the discovery of new types of antibiotics. So you had your tetracyclines, you had your macrolides, you had your chloramphenicols, your quinolone, so many different antibiotics discovered during this 20 to 25 year period. Unfortunately, it all stopped at the end of the 1970s and really since the end of the 1970s there is no new class of antibiotics found. Instead, what we see, the current approach is to modify existing antibiotics. So even if you see, look at doxycycline or tigacycline, they're all derivatives of previous classes of antibiotics. No real work has been done 
in the last 40 years on trying to discover new classes of antibiotics. And that really is one of the main reasons why I feel that we're in the mess that we're in right now, which we'll talk a little bit more about shortly. And just to give you an understanding of why this is important, because alongside this development of antibiotics is, of course, the concomitant uh, emergence of antibiotic resistance. So what is antibiotic resistance? In its very simplest sense, it's the ability of a bacteria and other microorganisms to resist the effect of an antibiotic to which they are once sensitive. Um, that is just a classic state of you have a sensitive bacteria, it's killed by the antibiotic, and suddenly it becomes resistant. How does that happen? Why does that happen? And I hope to give you a little bit of an overview of uh, exactly some of the mechanisms that are involved in this before we actually get down into the nitty-gritty. So this is just a cartoon that I spotted on World Press a few months ago. I thought it was pretty interesting. The antibiotic resistance given their piece of DNA to a little susceptible bacteria just wandering along. Um, but if we take a look at the bacteria itself, so this is a... A brief overview, a general overview of a bacterial cell. You can see you have your outer membrane, you have all the inner, your chromosome, your ribosomes, some some um, uh, surface features like the pili and uh, your flagella. But in general, you have all these different targets for antibiotics. And that's exactly what happens. So you get yourself an antibiotic. So for example, the tetracyclines attack the ribosome and prevent the ribosome from doing proper transcription and translation of messenger RNA to protein. So with the tetracycline, when you introduce a tetracycline, it permeates the cell, it starts attacking the 30S ribosome unit, and what you end up with seeing is that the proteins that they make don't make any sense just because it has interrupted this effect of the, 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 the accurate transcription or translation of messenger RNA into protein. And for example, the beta-lactams, so the beta-lactams attack your cell wall, um, so they don't even need to permeate the cell. The beta-lactams can come in, they latch, and they attack the peptic glycan layer of the, of, the, of the bacteria. And all the other different classes do similar things. So they all have targets. So anything that you can think of, the chromosome or the bacterial replicates, you have the quinolones, which interfere with the um, G DNA gyrase and the partition, preventing proper replication. So that's one of the, the strengths of antibiotics, that they all attack different targets. But of course, as we've found out over the years, the amazing thing about bacteria is they're able to do whatever you throw at them, they have an answer for it. So as I mentioned, uh, beta-lactams attack the outside of the cell. Well, they just secrete molecules out into the environment that attack the antibiotic before it reaches the cell. And anything you can think of, the bacteria have already have already done it. So you can have the uh, antibiotic come into the cell, well they just pump it back out faster. They can actually close down their outer membrane so that no, the bacteria can no longer, or the antibiotic can no longer permeate their cell. They can protect their target, so you will often see that they will like shield their target with methylases so that the, the antibiotic is no longer able to bind the target. Uh, modification of the target, which is you see, for example, in methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. That is just a simple modification of the peptidoglycan layer. So PBP2 replaces the normal peptidoglycan layer, and the drug is no longer able to bind to the new variant of PBP. So um, fascinating the way the bacteria has been able to, you know, adapt to whatever mechanisms that we try. I really like the mimicry of the target. So uh, you see in some cases, mupiricin resistance is a good example, where your antibiotic comes in, it, ta it, it attacks a very specific part of the bacteria. So what the bacteria is, it just makes a very small modification. So it has the target, and then it makes another target, but this target is even more affinity for the antibiotic. So the antibiotic comes in, and instead of attacking the proper target, it actually goes for this mimic. Um, and thus the cell can survive. So whatever strategies they come up with, bacteria have evolved these, these different mechanisms to overcome it. And it's really fascinating when you get down into the nuts and growths, the bolts of it. But if we even take a step back from that and we ask ourselves, well, how do bacteria do this? So there's really two main mechanisms by which bacteria are able to um, confer resistance. There's intrinsic, so 
you have, for example, some species of bacteria that are naturally intrinsically resistant to some classes of antibiotics due to whatever proteins they produce in their outer membrane. Um, or you can also have mutations in, um, so as I mentioned, one of the, the, um, the ways that they stop the antibiotic is stop it from coming into its, the cell. So they close down these pores on the outside to prevent the antibiotic from coming in. And this can be happened by just simple mutations that actually stop this protein from working. So no longer able to, um, no longer, the antibiotic is no longer able to permeate the cell. But the one that we're probably most interested in, the one that you hear all about in the news, is of course acquired resistance. And this is where you acquire a specific gene which makes a specific protein whose really sole purpose is to destroy or evade or um, protect your antibiotic target or, your, or, or the antibiotic itself. And this is what we know as, vert uh, this uh, leads us to like the next part, which is vertical transmission versus horizontal transmission. So when we talk about vertical transmission, uh, if we go back to the first point that we made there about the intrinsic, intrinsic resistance, so the nice thing about intrinsic, well not the nice thing, but the, the comforting thing about intrinsic resistance is that it only gets passed down to the daughter cells. So you have a mutation that happens in your chromosome that closes down your outer membrane. The only thing that happens, your bacteria divides, you make your daughter cells, they carry that same mutation. But what doesn't happen is that the cell, that mutation can move to another bacteria that's beside it. So we call that vertical transmission. And while it is important for some species of bacteria, it's really in terms of like how the spread of antibiotic resistance happens is not a very um, uh, interesting or a very um, uh, worrisome topic. More worrisome by far is horizontal transmission. Um, so here is, and I'm going to talk a lot more about plasmids, which you can see mobile plasma here. Um, and I'll talk about a lot more about that shortly. Um, but horizontal transmission is a different ballgame altogether. Um, what you end up with here is you have these small mobile pieces of DNA that exist outside the chromosome. And bacteria, in their own form of sex, are able to transfer that DNA to a bacterium in their, in their surroundings. And unfortunately, these mobile elements are hotspots for uh, and we'll talk more about that shortly as well, but hotspots for antibiotic resistance genes, harboring antibiotic resistance genes, and transferring them within the population. Um, a lot of it is through this process called conjugation, where you have a donor cell who has the plasmid, you have a recipient cell. At the donor cell, they make a pileus, uh, which then connects to the other cell, and they draw it in together. And then your plasmid, which carries normally, your, your, for example, your antibiotic resistance genes, is transferred over into the donor cell, replicates itself, and you have a donor and the recipients, which now are two donors, which can go up and then spread that DNA elsewhere. So pretty fascinating uh, example. But I really want to give you uh, just an overview of some of the work that we did to just show you how important this, this, these mechanisms are. So 2003, April of 2003, was the two weeks into the Iraq War. Um, major combat operations ended in 2011. In 2003, 12 percent, the very first Acinetobacter, I won't say the very first, but the first Acinetobacter Baumannii isolate seen at Walter Reed was, I can tell you exactly, it was the 23rd of April, 2012 was when we first isolated Acinetobacter Baumannii from a 26-year-old Special Forces soldier who had his leg blown off in Iraq just in the early days of the war. It was the very first time that we had seen Acinetobacter in about 15 years. In fact, if you talk to somebody infectious disease doctor at the time, they wouldn't even have, they weren't even able to pronounce the name Acinetobacter by money. It's so rare was it. Within two weeks, we had about seven cases, and it exploded after that. Uh, in 2006 was the highest year. But the thing about Acinetobacter baumannii is a very naturally resistant. So we'll go back to these intrinsic mechanisms. Acinetobacter on its own is quite intrinsically uh, resistant. But it's also a scavenger of DNA. So it likes to take up DNA from every... It doesn't give it out. It's very greedy. It takes DNA in and it uses that DNA to help itself. Um, but you, we, what we noticed that back in 2003, there were multi-drug resistance, so resistance to a lot of the beta-lactams, the aminoglycosides, the fluoroquinolones, 
So one of the last treatments that was available was carbapenems, which um, some of you, I'm sure, know are like the last resort, very potent, very expensive antibiotics, a class of beta-lactams that are almost considered on their own now, carbapenems. In 2003, only 12% of our acinetobacter were resistant to imipenem, which is one of the three main um, um, carbapenems. And steadily, as carbapenems were used throughout the eight years of the Iraq war, you can see the staggering 97.4%. By 2011, 97.4% of all acinetobacter isolated at Bethesda, well, what was the old Walter Reed on 16th Street, were resistant to imipenem. That left you with just colistin, which we're going to talk a little bit more about later. But that is dramatic how in the space of just eight years, this can emerge, disseminate, and just completely take over your hospital. And I tell you, this was like so traumatic for the soldiers at the time because there were so many missing, um, so many uh, amputations. And the difference between a below the knee and above the knee amputation is in the quality of your life, is you can't even begin to understand how different that is. You had a lot of soldiers where they would have a below the knee amputation, they would have acinetobacter by my infection, they were not able to get rid of it, so all they could do was cut, 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 cut all the way. And that was happening to so many of the soldiers during that time, um, exacerbated by the fact that we had these carbapenem resistant strains emerging at the same time. And I've given a number of talks on acinetobacter to 4T trick and stuff, it's a really fascinating story. Um, but I won't bore you too much more about it, and we'll, we'll, we'll press on with the main talk is how these antibiotic resistance genes move. So how does this happen? How do these genes move around? So we, I mentioned there a, uh, a minute or two ago about these plasmids that move around. Plasmids are really part of this family that we are now called the mobile genetic elements, and they really are the vehicles for resistance. I'm going to go a little bit geeky here. Um, you can just think of these plasma, these mobile genetic elements in three tiers. So on your very top layer, you have what we saw, the plasmids. And this to me is your mothership. This is like your Starship Enterprise or your Star Destroyer. This is the guy who carries everything around from place to place. And below that level, we have what we call transposons and insertion sequences. I'm being quite broad here. There's a number of other families involved, but these are the main players. And you can think of them like a shuttle. So they're moving from mothership to mothership, carrying their loads. And the loads that they're carrying, not exclusively integrons, but integrons are one of the main players in this, in this acquisition of antibiotic resistance genes, which are then taken up by the shuttles, which are these transposons and insertion sequences, which are then taken into the mothership, the plasmas, which then moves around from bacteria to bacteria. Um, so we're going to discuss each of these in a little bit more detail. So plasmids, you already saw that little circular piece of DNA. Um, so these are self-replicating. It's very important. So they usually contain all the genes that are required for them to actually spread, to, to, um, to, to move from uh, bacteria to bacteria, and also to replicate themselves. Not all the time. Sometimes they actually hijack what the bacterial DNA is doing over here and use it for themselves. But Predominantly, a lot of the plasmids that we study contain everything that they need for their own mobilization and movement. They're circular, closed circular pieces of DNA, um, and usually can be anywhere in size from actually as low as 1,000 base pairs, which is a very usually very small cryptic plasmids, but up to a, over a million base pairs. So if you think million base pairs, how is that in terms? So the human genome is 33 billion base pairs. The average bacteria ranges from 3 to 6 million. Um, this 1 million base pair, that's almost like saying that you took the human chromosome and you divided it in 1, 3 and you give a person 1 third of that chromosome. Um, so some of these plasmas can be huge, almost as big as the genomes in the organisms that carry them, which is fascinating to see them still be able to move from cell to cell even though they have that size. They exist in multiple copies, however, the good rule of thumb is the larger the plasmid, the less copy number there is. So when you see these huge plasmids of six, seven hundred thousand base pairs, that usually means that there are only one or two copies within a cell. The smaller ones around 10 or 20, kilo, kilo, uh, 20, 10 or 20 thousand bases, they can be up to 40 or 50 copies within the cell. Uh, 
as I mentioned already, they can replicate independently of the chromosome. And of course, we saw that little pileus and where they can transfer from one bacteria to other in a process known as conjugation. So the same in image I showed you a couple of slides ago, um, just to refresh your memory on it. Um, so as I mentioned, these are the primary vehicles. They're the mothership that carries all these antibiotic resistance uh, genes around. But what's even more disturbing, I'm going to show you some images of plasmas that we've studied in our lab, is that they can carry a wide range of antibiotic resistance genes and, and a process known as co-selection. So just for example, this is a plasma we had from a patient at Walter Reed Army Hospital who was infected with KPC2. Has anybody heard of KPC2? This is one of the carbapenems, the superbug plasmids. So this gene wipes out all that imipenem, meropenem, and carbapenems that you uh, we talked about a little bit earlier. But take a look at this. Carbapenems, aminoglycosides, sulfonamides, sulf3. Does that sound familiar? The sulfa drugs back in the early 1920s when sulfa drugs were extensively used. Sulf3, 1, 2, and 3 are nearly always found in these plasmids. They are holdovers from a hundred years ago. And not only that, but Sol3 is in an enviable position of actually granting a benefit to its host. So some antibiotic resistance genes actually cause some problems for the host, and we'll talk about that with colistin shortly, but Sol is one of those genes that actually confers an advantage to the bacteria. Aminoglycosides, chloramphenicols, aminoglycosides, beta-lactams, beta-lactams, a second copy, just in case one's not enough. Let's have a second one. Uh, Carbapenemases. You think that's bad? Take a look at this guy from a Pseudomonas aeruginosa from Baltimore shock trauma. 25 antibiotic resistance genes. Everything in red is an antibiotic resistance gene, and the green, which is the BIM. So BIM is like KPC. It's another one of these nasty superbug genes. And again, you can see the same thing. We have beta-lactam, extended spectral beta-lactams, we have trimethoprim, uh, aminoglycosides, thoramphenicols, beta-lactams, aminoglycosides, thoramphenicols, thoramphenicols, tetracyclines, pretty much every antibiotic class, all in one plasmid sitting in one pseudomonas aeruginosa, which can be transferred to anybody else. Striking. So what happens is, if you have a, 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 a bacteria and you're trying to treat it with tetracycline and it's got a tetracycline resistance gene, well I'm sorry you've just selected not just for tetracycline resistance but for all these other resistances too. And that's one of the major problems that we're encountering now that oh well it's okay we're using tetracyclines in animal, you know oxytetracycline in fish farming but we don't use it in humans that's all very well but unfortunately these plasmids play to that, that weakness and by using these antibiotics outside human medicine, and I will be the first to admit in human medicine also, they are causing all these problems in this co-selection of all these other resistances with it. So if we go back, so that was our top tier. So we look at this structure and we're like, well, how does a plasma get all these different antibiotic resistances? And I'm going to give you a little hint if you look at the white arrows here. And those white arrows are really the cargo ships that are doing all the damage. So this goes back to a very famous woman, Barbara McClintock, in the late 1940s and 1950s. She did what eventually became a, she won the Nobel Prize in 1983 for her discovery was on transposons and insertion sequences. And basically, a transposon are segments of bacterial a, DNA that can move from one position on a chromosome to a different position on the same chromosome or a different chromosome. So rather than the plasma that moves from bacteria to bacteria, you now have this small piece of DNA that can jump around from segment to segment. And this is a most simple, an insertion sequence is actually the simplest form of transposon. Very simple structure you have, and it's, these are pretty important, these 50 base inverted repeats at both ends, and in the middle is a protein, and that protein encodes that transposase. That transposase, binds to those oops, sorry, your transposase binds to these 50 base inverted repeats, cuts it out, or copies it out. And this is where the cut, copy and paste mechanism comes in. Uh, so the transposase is made, and this is the transposase that is made by this gene here. It sits down at the end of your transposase, cuts it out, cleaves it, and can move to another position. 
So that's, this is the cut and paste mechanism. There's also a copy and paste mechanism. Instead of actually cutting it out, it just copies itself and moves. <clears throat> but a very simple, a very simple uh, mechanism. Just literally cut out the gene, move to another part of the genome. Um, uh, cut yourself out of the chromosome, move to another part of the chromosome. And this is very important in terms of disrupting genes. So what you'll notice with this cut and paste mechanism, a transposon can jump out of one place and it'll jump right into the middle of another gene and totally disrupt that gene, destroy the protein. So for example, where we talked about, oh, a mutation that knocks out that protein that makes the pore on your surface, it's exactly what transposons do. They jump out, they jump into that gene that codes, encodes to that pore, and they knock out that pore, so that pore is no longer available. This is just one mechanism. This one is a little bit haphazard, because it's jumping around. There's actually some rules as to where these transposons jump. I won't go into that in any detail, because it's pretty complicated. And there's a book that thick at home that even I have a hard time getting through. But as this is a little bit haphazard. It's still jumping around the place. It's a lot of selection. Um, you know, so it's really just a natural evolution and natural selection that allows the one that's lost the poor to move to, to become dominant in the population. But what's even more um, tricky about transposons is another method of copying pathways. So this is the second mechanism. This is a very a pretty complicated subject, a really fascinating subject actually about how DNA works. But what I really want to draw your attention to is this this uh, figure down here, because basically what's happened here is you've had one copy that transpose on through to the action of trans um, uh, replication. So basically, it's inserting itself here and having a second copy. And there's a gene sequence over here that this transpose on likes. There's some mess, there's some trans, uh, uh, there's some interaction that goes on between these two points here, and what you end up is two copies of your uh, transposon flanking, now flanking this segment of DNA. And if you remember, I told you that at the edge of these transposons are these like repeats that they like to use. So the transposon gets made, it sits down at both sides, and it takes it out. Well, now look, you have another one of these repeats down here. And this is where you end up with a composite transposon. And what happens is the protein binds here, and then it says, oh, I've got another one down here. Let me take this one instead of this one. And in the middle of it is a bunch of DNA. And usually the, bunch, the ones that have succeeded and have evolved, these are the ones that are carrying antibiotic resistance genes. So now what you end up, instead of just this IS-10 on its own moving around the place, there's two copies of IS-10 with all the DNA in between, and this whole unit, this is a very famous transposon, TN10, another very famous one, TN3, because it goes back to ampicillin and tetracycline resistance, which are some of the very first ones that were described. So TN10 is now moving as an entire unit, taking this tetracycline resistance gene with it and inserting itself into plasmids and chromosomes and now moving. And this has been one of the most dramatic changes in the epidemiology of antibiotic resistance in the last 40 to 50 years is how these transposons have mobilized all these genes. And if we go back to that image that I showed you of this, uh, this plasmid from that patient in Chuck Drum in Baltimore that had 25 antibiotic resistance genes, you just do a quick search. There is IS-26, you saw IS-10, there's IS-26 on both sides carrying uh, resistance, I do believe it is, to um, uh, met, uh, I think it's a heavy metal resistance gene. We have IS-26 again, flanking resistance to sulfonamides, chloramphenicol, beta-lactams, aminoglycosides. We have IS-432 with uh, resistance to carbapenems, multiple. So you can see all these vehicles have moved these sets of genes from wherever they first picked them up onto this plasmid, bit by bit by bit by bit. And this plasmid, you can tell, is an old plasmid. This has been around for a while, picking up more and more antibiotic resistance genes. And at this stage, you can see it at least four events. There's probably some more here. So uh, other stuff goes on. There's some evolution in here. Some pieces get left behind. Some pieces get get taken away, so sometimes it can be hard to trace the history of these older plasmids, but already you can see there's at least four, and I would probably guesstimate about eight different events where antibiotic resistance genes have, have 
settle themselves into this uh, plasma. And I wanted to show MCO1 because this is the transferable glycerin resistance, which is actually a very fascinating transposon. So ISAPL1, um, I reviewed a paper recently, and we're pretty sure that um, MCO1 has emerged from Moraxella porcii, which is a bacteria implicated in meningitis in swine. This makes total sense. Calistin is widespreadly used in China and India um, and other Asian countries, particularly in China, where the, pol or the swine industry is quite big. Uh, Moraxella porcii is a uh, infectious agent of swine. And sure enough, Moraxella actually has a chromosomal gene that is almost identical to MCO1, which has been picked up by this ISAPL1 transposon. Um, so the same thing that happened here. So ISAPL1, the first one arrived in, then the second one arrived in, and now it is capturing this entire area together. And it now moves as a unit, which is known, just recently been named TN6332. Uh, and of course, once captured, as we've all seen, this MCR1 gene is now being moved and has been moving probably for the last 40 years without people realizing it uh, around the globe. What's interesting is the composite transposon, um, because it's still as a composite transposon, it can still jump out. So you see cases where a transposon will come in with the antibiotic resistance gene, it might sit for a little while, and there's no selection pressure, it jumps back out again. Uh, what you see with MCO1 is some degradation. So on maybe about 25% of the isolates that we look at, you see it still has an intact copy of this movable unit. But in about another 50%, it's lost this downstream copy. So there's all sort of mutations that have happened here. But what has happened is that this repeat unit is gone. So it no longer moves. So it is now stabilized within the plasmid vector and will be continuously passed on from daughter, from uh, not only vertically, but can also be transferred horizontally on uh, the plasmid because it is no longer movable. And we've even gone, just to show you how long MCL1 has been around, there's actually quite another 25% of isolates where it has lost both. And there's, there's, foot, there's fingerprints on either side here where you can tell it was once there but it's now gone. Uh, it has lost both copies of ISLPO1, so now MCO1 is completely stabilized within the plasma vector and will be passed on and passed around uh, indefinitely without any chance of it jumping back out again. It's a pretty interesting story um, and very fascinating just from molecular biology viewpoints. Um, but just to go one last, so take it one step further, so as we mentioned, these transposons and these insertion sequence are really the shuttles that carry it around. Well, what exactly, why is there nine antibiotic resistance, or one, two, seven antibiotic resistance genes together? Why is there two here? And a lot of this comes back to the fundamental unit of antibiotic resistance, and that is the integron. Um, and so these are uh, DNA elements that can capture and carry genes. On their own, they're immobile, but they're primarily associated with transposons which move them around. Um, and here's a one good example. I'm going to give you a blow up of it. Um, so what we have here is this is a, a protein called an integrase, and it has these sites. It's almost like a little cargo shuttle, and one by one by one, it can just add new antibiotic resistance genes. So this it, st it stays immobile itself, but this area here, the ATT1 site, is able to capture new antibiotic resistance genes and literally add them. So you start it off with this, and then you add OXA2, then A, and add, and add, and add. And I've seen some of these where it's 14 antibiotic resistance genes all in a line sitting behind these integrase. And of course, that integrase is then taken up by a transposon, captures the entire thing. So here's an example where I had to blow it out so you could see it better. But here's your integrase gene that's carrying the carapenemase aminoglycoside, 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 chloramphenicol resistance, sulfonamide resistance, quaternium ammonium compound resistance, and all this flanked by TN1696. So TN1696 comes in and takes this entire cassette of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8 antibiotic resistance genes and is able to move them around the place. Absolutely fascinating um, how the bacteria have adapted to these. Um, so I'm going to finish up uh, fairly soon on that note. Um, just to go back over what I talked about, 
So I hope everybody got appreciation for just how intricate antibiotic resistance gene movement is. It's not just some, simply a word that we bandy about. There's really um, some fascinating and interesting mechanisms involved. Um, the plasmids, as I say, which we, I'm sure most of us have heard of plasmids because that's what a lot of people talk about. They really are the motherships that move from bacteria to bacteria, but within the plasmids themselves, there's so much more going on with these transposons, insertion sequence, integrons. And, and, and if I'm honest, I'm really only touching the tip of the iceberg in the amount of different elements that are involved in moving um, antibiotic ge resistance genes around. So really, what does that mean for our future? Um, I'm of the belief, and I know some people have knocked antibiotics, that they are probably one of the most seminal discoveries in medicine. The, the impact that antibiotics has had on infectious disease is phenomenal. Uh, if you compare the difference of even just something as uh, base as the amount of deaths from infectious diseases in the United States Army, um, from the Mexican Civil War in 1812, the Mexican War, American Mexican War in 1812, to the Gulf War, the difference in the amount of soldiers that have died from infections compared to those that have died from deaths is on orders of magnitude. And a lot of that is due to antibiotics and being able to um, properly treat uh, the infections. Same thing applies for medicine. Most surgeries you are getting prophylactic antibiotics to prevent any sort of infection um, even before you go under the knife. Um, so I, I, have, I have great admiration. I, I, absolutely, there has been some problems with antibiotic resistance. Um, a lot of this has been, as we mentioned earlier, just the, no new development of drugs since the 1970s. One of the biggest problems, of course, is misuse of antibiotics. It's people who you have your sore throat and you get your one week course of antibiotics and you take it for three days and you feel better and you go, oh, I'm not going to take it, bother taking it for the next four days. That's probably the worst thing you could do than even take an antibiotic in the first place. Because what you've done is you've killed off most of the sensitive bacteria, but you've left a little small population left that will eventually reemerge and then your antibiotic is used, useless. Um, and the same goes true, true, you know, no, no, no one group is to blame. You can't blame farmers. You can't blame uh, animal husbandry. Everybody has had their, their input into uh, the misuse and, unfortunately, the, the loss of potency in their antibiotics right across all fields, including human medicine. Uh, and, of course, on top of this, you have a, species, a, a group of organisms that have been around almost since the dawn of time who reproduce every 20 minutes under the, you know, under good circumstances and can literally try any different mechanism they want, leading to all this development and acquisition of different resistances. Bacteria, I won't like to use the word smart, but they have all the time and they have all the population that they need to just try everything until they find something that works. Um, but I think also what's often missed when we talk about this stuff is how much antibiotic resistance and studying antibiotic resistance has led us to such a fundamental understanding of DNA and how DNA works. All this work on transposons and plasmids, all of it emerged from people's desire to find more about antibiotic resistance. And it really, you know, if you ever get a chance to pick up a textbook on mobile DNA, it's fascinating right down at the molecular level how these, uh, how DNA works. And so with that thought, I just want to say shout out to my lab. Uh, so this is Kathy and Rosin, who are my technicians. Uh, uh, Colonel Hinkle, who's now uh, the MRSN director. Uh, Colonel Lesher, who started the MRSN, he's now at Rochester uh, Hospital in upstate New York. Um, and we have a database group, bioinformatics group. Uh, we even have a CAP certified lab. Uh, my contact information is there if anybody needs it. And I'd be more than happy to take any questions that people might have. Yes. Absolutely. Great question. Um, so there's a lot of different strategies out there at the moment. We've heard talk here actually at this meeting about bacteriophage, there's small molecule inhibitors. Um, where do I see it going? 
I'll be brutally honest with you, bacteriophage, bacteria develop resistance to bacteriophage. They've been at war with each other since the dawn of time. Just like us and viruses, phage are to bacteria what we, you know the common cold is to humans. Um, I think uh, one of the, and I didn't mention it, and I didn't go into it in too much detail tonight, but like one of the interesting things about um, antibiotic resistance is it actually exerts a, um, an effect on, on the cell, an energy cost. So a good example is colistin resistance, MCO1. Basically what it does, uh, colistin is a detergent that pretty much acts by disrupting the outer membrane of a bacteria. So the bacteria get around that by growing this whole new sheet of protection around the cell. But growing that sheet actually costs a lot of energy, costs a lot of um, uh, energy that the bacteria could be using for something else. So you'll see, um, we had a very interesting case of a patient in Bahrain who he suffered a stroke in Bahrain. He was a retired army. He came back through Germany, through Longshore in Germany, back to the United States. Um, he was colonized with an MCR1 bacteria when he arrived in the United States. And within two weeks of arriving here in the United States, a second E. coli, MCR1 negative, so colistin sensitive, emerged um, and actually took over. And within two weeks, the MCR1 positive E. coli was gone. Um, because it was outcompeted by what was, um, what was, uh, you know, uh, it was an expec strain, so it was actually it was able to, you know, it was more adapted for human host, and it just basically kicked out. Not only did it kick out the MCR1 positive E. coli, it didn't even take a list and resistance for itself. Um, so that was like pretty interesting, and you know, there's there's been like. Um, there's definitely been like papers showing that colistin resistance is actually a pretty heavy burden on the cell in terms of energy cost and the ability of the bacteria to survive in the absence of colistin, which was the case here. They didn't know the patient was being treated for a stroke. He wasn't being treated for colonization by, he wasn't being given colistin, he wasn't being given any antibiotics, but that bacteria was not able to compete against a more fit version because MCR1 is constitutively active. You can't turn it on and turn it off. It's, since you've got it, you're making that outer sheet whether you need it or not. Um, so I think you can see there's definitely reports out there where people start really taking judicious use of their antibiotics. You can see a dramatic decrease in the number of resistant organisms that are out there. Just because that, and once that energy, you know, once the benefit of that gene is gone and it's still costing you energy, the bacteria will jettison it. They're, you know, they're very um, opportunistic. There will always be a subpopulation that are going to hold on to it and might come back. Um, but I, 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 I'm, I'm always, you know, I find it encouraging at least that with judicious use, with proper use, proper regulation, you actually can reverse some of these trends. I do see in the future a lot of the other um, technologies coming into play, and more specific small molecule inhibitors and bacteriophage. Um, and I think it's, it's really, you know, an open game at the moment because things are developing so fast. Oh, my God. It, you know, I did my PhD 10 years ago, and even just watching how much the field has changed now is, like, dramatic. I mean, things that we're doing now that I wouldn't even have thought about, you know, 10 years ago. Yeah. Yes? Um, this is really excellent. I have a couple of questions. Um, the first is, so the work that has been done at Walter Eater and Bethesda Naval mm -hmm. on antibiotic resistance, did much of that work start in the beginning of the Iraq War? And, and if not, what comparable work, if it had been done during the Vietnam War? Itself? Right. Good. Very good question. So, first, easy answer is no. no. This was not done at the start of the Iraq War. Um, I think a lot of it was complacency because we hadn't been in a serious ground conflict in decades. You know, excluding Gulf War One, which really was not really a war, and you didn't have too many casualties coming back. Um, Nobody really expected what was going on, you know. Um, so all these soldiers started coming back in, especially when the insurgency really started getting going. So um, a lot of the, they were completely blindsided. But I would love to say that if we had what the MRSN does now back in those days, we would no way have the same problem that we do now. Because there was thousands of acinetobacter soldiers, thousands of soldiers infected by acinetobacter. And you know what? We can trace it back to six strains, six different bacteria that spread. It's not like there was a thousand different acinetobacters. There was only six acinetobacters that did all the damage. And they, you could see, you can actually see a picture of the ICU 
where you had the soldier came in on July the 14th, on July the 17th, the nurse was infected, on July the 22nd, the old person in three beds down was infected. You can actually trace the epidemiology, and no, but nobody had a clue. There was no molecular work going on. There was no, there was PFGE, which isn't even, you know, it's gone the way of the dodo now. You cannot do proper transmission dynamics without whole genome sequencing. That's why I think that is going to be, that's really a transformative technology, whole genome sequencing, in terms of epidemiology. If you go back to the Iraq war, ironically enough, because most of those journals are not uh, in digitized yet, if you go back to the paper journals in Vietnam War, guess what's the biggest, one of the biggest bacteria that caused all the trouble? Acinetobacter baumannii. Came, all the doctors got excited about it in the 1970s, late 60s, early 70s, disappeared, all those people retired, all that expertise went out the window, few people stuck around with Acinetobacter. There you go, 40 years later, re-emerges as like such a huge threat. Yeah, really interesting. <clears throat> yep. Is, um, so I, um, a few months ago, I tried to get data on antibiotic um, resistance studies in Afghanistan and yep. in Iraq, <clears throat> okay. um, which would be interesting for comparison. Yep. There's very little that's been done. Okay. Are you aware of Yes, um, I can tell you I have an acinator back to Balmana from a water buffalo sitting outside a tent in Iraq. I have acinator back there from the tent flaps in some of the tents. We all our bugs come from all that acinator back came out of Iraq. That's pretty much guaranteed. But in terms of, of antibiotic resistance yep. among say Iraqi soldiers. Yeah, so actually so one of so initially at the initial start of the Iraq war patients were cohorted. Um, Iraqi troops, insurgents were treated alongside Marines and other soldiers. I shouldn't say soldiers from Marines, I could get me shot. <laughs> other service members uh, were treated all under the one roof. But um, they did away with that when they found out that the soldiers, American soldiers were going over and they were calling, they had Acinetobacter by Miami, but they were totally wimpy. They were like sensitive to everything. And they were coming back with these Acinetobacter that were just like covered in antibiotic resistance. And they found out that this was what was being carried by Iraqi civilians and Iraqi uh, soldiers were carrying these multi-drug resistant um, acinetobacter because there was no controls of antibiotics during Saddam Hussein's era and they were using antibiotics willy-nilly. And you see that everywhere now. You go down to Latin America and South America, unfortunately, the place is covered in antibiotic resistance genes. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, definitely, we're, we've been trying, so I think our collection is representative of what, actually an interesting thing, some of the strains are, are Mosul and Fallujah and Baghdad. So you have a very specific strain. When there was a, you know, the Operation Phantom Fury, which was the second battle of Fallujah in 2006, um, there was a huge outbreak of OXA-58, ST-32, Acinetobacter baumannii. That was confined to Fallujah, soldiers coming out of Fallujah. Um, similar with Mosul, we had an ST1 out of Mosul and ST2 coming out of Mosul. It was actually pretty, in, it's fascinating to see the epidemiology of it. Um, but I think our strains are representative of what was going on in Iraq. Um, we also see that, um, you know, there's studies now from that area. So the Iranians and the Lebanese and the Israelis and the Jordanians have done some Asanita back to work. And sure enough, you see similar strains to what we saw in Iraq. If you switch very quickly over to Afghanistan, um, our problem coming out of Afghanistan has always been um, these carbapenemase superbugs. Every single, not every single, but pretty much 90% of all MDM positive isolates I have in my repository, which is about 47, are from Afghanistan, from soldiers in Afghanistan or from, from locals who have been treated in Afghanistan. Same, it's right next door to Pakistan and India, and that's where it was all found. The place is covered in, in antibiotic resistance as well. Yep. Any other questions? So is there any propensity to restriction sites for these for the transposons? Uh, what, what do you mean by... So where do you jump around? Selection of one restriction site over another. Yes, there is. Um, I'll give you a really good example. The MCO1 that a transposon TN, it likes to go into an area that is rich in aden uh, ATs, so adenine and thymine residues, with a slight uh, GC bias in the center. They're all different, so that's the crazy thing. Some of them have a bias for AT, some of them bias for thymines, some have a, bi a bias for cytosine or guanine. 
Um, the whole there's a whole family. I mean, there's thousands of families of these transposons, all with their own specificity and and, and then nothing is like a hundred percent. You know, like most of biology, it's you know you have a a bell bell shaped curve. They're like really like this particular structure, but you know you know five percent of them might go into this structure or two percent go into this structure every now and again they'll still go into structures that might be ideal yeah yes yes they did no clostridium difficile what happened no, no, no. i was shocked um and the same thing there they're asking and trying very hard to find ways to survive the mutation that they have to try to develop the potential treatment for the mosaic treatment. I don't yeah. know what it's going to be. Right. Um, and I'm hoping everybody picks up on it, but I think they've also embraced what you said, and that is how people are truthfully be better students. Yeah. Very important products. And the biggest issue there is education. Right, and absolutely. So I just wonder, was there anything that you saw that the WHO could have done or should do further enhance? Awareness of what this means. Yeah, I mean, I think, not to be politically incorrect, but at a certain stage you've got to stand up and say, you've got some serious problems in certain countries around this world that are not being addressed. I mean, I look at Walter Reed Army Hospital. I, in the last seven years, we have probably had 34 patients with KPC in seven years. I can show you a hospital. I can give you show you a hospital in Tegalupa in Honduras that had... 14 babies die in two weeks from KPC Klebsiellus. They're every, they sent us 37 bacteria from Honduras. Every single one of them was KPC positive. There was no, you know. I mean, there's a huge disparity between what goes on in the developed nations compared to what is going on in some of the, the newly developing nations. Um, so you go into Europe. A lot of Europe's problems is not caused by what's going on in Europe. It's by what's causing coming in from outside. The United States is the same. KPC emerged what looks like in South America, came up through Puerto Rico, and landed in New York City in 19, late 1990s and stealthily spread throughout the population there before people realized what was going on. Um, if it was a case that you could implement the sort of controls and regulations that we have in Europe and the United States to other countries around the globe, I think that would go a long way to addressing the issue. Right now, you've you still, you can introduce all the regulations you want here in the United States, but if you have food and um, and everything in being imported from all over the world, how are you going to stop these things anyway? So it really requires a global response. And I'm surprised, I was a little bit disappointed that who didn't like, you know, just come out and say, we really need a global response to this. People can't be happy. And it's true. You can go to a store in India and you can literally buy whatever antibiotic you want on the corner street. I mean, that's just disaster. I, when I was doing my PhD, we were doing fish farming, and my professor would tell me that he was over in Sri Lanka, and they would literally arrive with a articulated truck full of oxytetracycline and just into the shrimp farm. The entire truck contents. I mean, that's crazy. But yeah, so yeah, I think, I think it's just a realization that this is something that can't be done regionally. It really requires an effort of, of everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You're welcome. And, uh, traditional of the One Health Academy, we like to give our guest speakers a uh, flag that's been flown over the Capitol building. So cool. uh, thank, yeah, you so thank you so much. much. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you. Um, and there's plenty of food left, plenty of time for discussion. Feel free to have another drink. There's, we're not kicking you out. So feel free and uh, network some more. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.